there. Okay, tonight it is my pleasure to introduce you to Steve Taylor, who will be talking to us about extraordinary awakenings when trauma leads to transformation. That's his latest book. He's actually published 14 books along the way, focusing mostly on psychology and spirituality. Uh, could you please turn your... Um, okay. Uh, Steve is a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University in the UK, and he is uh, a terrific guy. And somebody, I just finished reading um, Eckhart Tolle's book, um, The Power of Now. And Akar Toll speaks and is connected to Steve in many different ways. So I think you might find him as interesting as I will. So Steve, take it away. Uh, we're really glad you're here. And I'm quite anxious to hear what you have to say. And I've already signed up for your meditation on your website. Oh, I'm ready. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Um, looking forward to speaking with you for the next hour or so. And yeah, I'm going to speak about um, my research into spiritual awakening. As a psychologist, I've been doing research into spiritual awakening for about 15 years now. And I, of course, have my own experiences, which contribute to my awareness of spiritual awakening but in the in the main i'm going to speak about this extraordinary phenomenon which i call transformation through turmoil uh, which is when people go through intense psychological turmoil of one form or another and in the process undergo a radical transformation of identity sometimes to the point where they feel that they are different people living in the same body <clears throat> so I'll, sh I'll share with you some examples of um, these extraordinary awakenings which feature in my book and I also want to explore the reasons why this transformation occurs you know what is actually happening psychologically or spiritually when people undergo this transformation and what can we learn you know what can we learn from these transformations and apply to our own paths of, of personal development and um Later on, I'm going to focus on one particular quality, which is very important in these awakenings or these transformations, and that's the quality of acceptance. So later on, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through an exercise based on the principle of acceptance. But I'd like to begin, actually, with a, a short poem. I write poetry. I'd like to begin with a short poem just to introduce the session. And maybe after this poem, I'll lead you into a, a short meditation as well, just to to introduce a session and to empty empty our minds of other concerns and to create a, a mood of of stillness but let me begin by reading a a short poem and this is called meeting purely in presence this is about you know letting go of all preconceptions and all conditions and all all prejudices when we meet people for the first time and I'm meeting you for the first time. We're, you know, some of you are meeting each other for the first time. So this is a way of sort of entering into a, a mode of presence in this encounter with each other. So this is um, meeting purely in presence. Let's meet without pretense, without hierarchies of status or artificial shows of respect, without trying to, to impress each other with our knowledge or charm or humor. Let's meet without fear of exposing our vulnerabilities, without being embarrassed by our need for love or pretending to be self-sufficient. Let's meet without the past, without letting our urge to connect be obstructed by old resentments, without letting our natural empathy be blocked by hard, fixed prejudice. Let's meet without insecurity, knowing we don't have to prove that we're worthy of each other's affection, since love doesn't need to be earned or gained, but simply allowed to flow. Let's meet without intentions, without any designs or goals, knowing we don't have to try to relate to each other because we're already related. 
knowing that there's nothing we need to do except allow ourselves to be. Let's meet purely in presence, without any conditions or concepts, knowing that in essence, we are the same and that in being, we are one. So just for a, for a couple of minutes, let's, um, let's share a brief meditation. Maybe you can close your eyes for a moment. To me, spirituality is largely about connection. So this is a short meditation on connection. Connection is also linked to, to presence. Because when we are present to one another, that's when we fully connect with one another. When we let go of all the barriers and all of the filters and open our boundaries to one another. So let's begin by connecting to our bodies for a moment. Just be aware of your physical body. Be aware of the, the points where your body meets its environment, where your feet meet the floor, where your back meets the chair that you're sitting on. Be aware of your clothes touching your skin. Just bring your whole awareness into your, your physical body for a moment and all of those points of contact. Be aware of your breathing as well. Be aware of the air entering and leaving through your nose brushing the inside of your nose as you breathe in and out. Just follow your breath as the air enters and leaves your body. Also feeling your stomach as it rises and falls with your breath. And now let's bring our attention inside, into our inner space, into our inner energy. Just bring your attention into your mind for a moment, into your mental space. Maybe you can feel the energy inside your mental space. Maybe you can observe associations, thoughts passing through your mental space. And just feel the, the energy, the vibrant dynamic energy that's flowing within your mental space. And let's move our attention lower, away from our minds, into the whole of our inner bodies. Just be aware of the, the energy inside your body, around the air of your neck, down into your chest, down into your arms, down towards your hands and fingers. Maybe you can feel the, the dynamic quality of the energy inside your arms and your hands, a warm glow of inner radiance. 
And let's follow the energy down into the air of your stomach, your lower back, down into your waist, down into your upper legs, your thighs, down past your knees, down towards your feet and your toes. So maybe you can feel that inner energy glowing and flowing inside your body, your inner being. Maybe you can feel it in its entirety all the way throughout the whole of your body, the whole of this inner energy, your inner vitality flowing and gently vibrating through every part of your body. Filling you, with, filling you with a a warm glow of relaxation and a sense of connection to your inner being. And now let's expand that that feeling of connection towards all the other people who are part of this group this evening. Maybe you can feel how your inner being is shared with all of the people here in this group. How your own inner being somehow stretches and spreads beyond your own body into the beings of other people. So that we all share the same fundamental consciousness. Or inner being. So let's relish that feeling of connectedness with each other, that feeling of sharing the same fundamental consciousness. That feeling of how our own inner being doesn't just belong to us but spreads out and is shared by other human beings. Let's just relish and savour that feeling of connectedness for a moment. And now let's bring our attention back to our breathing for a moment. Just being aware of the, the air as it enters and leaves your nose again. With your stomach rising and falling. And return your attention to the sounds inside your room. Also the sounds outside your room. And let's slowly open our eyes again and bring this meditation to a close. Thanks everybody. Hope you enjoyed this meditation. As I was illustrating in the meditation, to me, spirituality and spiritual awakening is about connection. It's about expanding beyond our own individual beings, our own individual egos, and connecting with other human beings, other living beings, connecting to the whole of the natural world and the whole universe itself. And also it's about connecting to a deeper level of our own being. So that we realize that we're not just our superficial egos or our superficial identities with our thoughts and desires and our concepts of ourselves. We're actually something much bigger than that. 
and in spiritual awakening we we expand beyond our normal limited sense of self and become part of something much bigger at the same time as becoming a much bigger or larger self and that's essentially what what spiritual awakening awakening is and i've always felt that spiritual awakening is much more common than most people realize many people think that spiritual awakening is something that only happens to to monks and mystics and gurus people who've been meditating for 40 years or people who've been living in refuges or hermitages or monasteries for decades but i i found that spiritual awakening is spiritual awakening is much more common than that it's something that can happen to to ordinary people in the midst of everyday life people who don't even know anything about spirituality in a traditional sense people who aren't religious people who don't follow any spiritual path or practice it can happen accidentally um, to people in the midst of everyday life and usually when that happens it's connected to what i call transformation through turmoil and i'm just going to going to share a few slides now just to illustrate uh, the concept of transformation through turmoil and also to illustrate the concept of spiritual awakening in general so hopefully you can see these slides uh, maybe i'll just um see if i can make them bigger so that they take up the whole screen Mm, I can't seem to work out how to do that. But anyway, you can see them as they are, so that, that's fine, I guess. So as I, was, as I was just saying, spirituality is about connection, but it's also uh, about expansion. In spiritual awakening, um, there's an expansion of awareness in a lot of different areas. There's, there's an expansion of awareness in terms of perception, so that the world around us becomes more real and more beautiful and mundane things suddenly seem much more interesting than they did before everything sort of comes to life as if an extra dimension of reality has been added to the to our surroundings in terms of subjective awareness there's an expansion of identity as i, as I was saying before there's a feeling that we become something much bigger internally we gain access to deeper levels of our own being we become aware of potentials and aspects of our own identity which were hidden before it's almost as if we were living in a, a kind of a tiny attic room at the top of a house but in spiritual awakening we become aware of all these other floors all of these other rooms in the house so the whole house becomes something much bigger and we seem to expand our identity there's also an expansion of awareness in terms of intersubjectivity which is a kind of philosophical word which means connection to other people so our awareness expands in terms of empathy and compassion and also altruism. So we, we, we connect with other people in the sense that we are able to, to, to sense their, their feelings. When they feel pain, we can feel their pain and we feel the impulse to alleviate their pain in some way. And that's why a lot of spiritually awakened people become very altruistic. They live for others. They spend a lot of their time just helping others because they feel that intense sense of connection to others. And finally, there's an expansion of awareness in conceptual terms. And that means that people have a much wider perspective on reality. They don't, they don't just live from the narrow perspective of their, of their own desires and interests. They have a much wider perspective, a more global rather than, rather than an egocentric perspective. So those are, those are the main aspects of spiritual awakening in, in my, you know, in my own concept, which is essentially non-religious. I mean, obviously, spiritual awakening can occur in the context of religions, um, but in my, you know, my research, it often occurs outside that context, even outside the context of spiritual traditions in the normal sense. And I found that there are there are three ways in which spiritual awakening can arise. The first and probably least common way in which it can arise is when it's simply natural to people 
that's when they are they're just people are just born spiritually awakened and they never lose their spiritual wakefulness it's just innate to them they don't need to meditate or to undergo a sudden moment of transformation they just are naturally spiritually awakened they have a natural expansive awareness and that those people often become poets or painters they that's why i've got two paintings here one of them's from um jmw turner the british artist another one is from monet the french artist when you look at these paintings you can get a glimpse of what it means to to perceive the world with heightened awareness you know with that sense of beauty and that sense of uh, vivid intense perception which spiritually awakened people have sometimes people who are not who are naturally awakened become social activists because they they feel a an intense sense of connection and empathy for other people the second way in which spiritual awakening can occur is when it's when it's cultivated gradually through spiritual practices and paths so there, there are there are millions of people all around the world probably hundreds of millions of people around the world who are following some kind of spiritual path or some kind of set of spiritual practices which enable them to grow spiritually for some people it could be the the, the path of buddhism the path of taoism the path of the kabbalah it could be the 12-step the path in, in aa which is also obviously a spiritual path but if you follow one of these paths you know it's inevitable that if you follow it you know in a disciplined way and if you follow the practices closely and regularly it's inevitable that you will undergo some degree of spiritual awakening even if it's so gradual that you don't realize it's happening often spiritual development takes place over years even decades so often people are not aware that it's actually taking place the third way in which awakening can occur is when it happens suddenly and dramatically and that's when it usually when it happens in the form of transformation through turmoil so let me give you a bit more information about transformation through turmoil so the turmoil in question it can be anything really it can be serious illness such as a diagnosis of, of cancer bereavement is a very common trigger of transformation through turmoil it can be depression a long period of depression it could be disability suddenly becoming disabled through an accident or illness it could be addiction a long period of addiction or just a general process of loss you know a general sense of disappointment and failure and you know sort of a long period of of humiliation or failure and so forth but sometimes obviously obviously transformation through turmoil does not always happen it's quite rare but in some cases when people go through long periods of turmoil such as the above they undergo a radical transformation into a higher functioning state which is equivalent to spiritual awakening i found in my research that it's not uncommon in in prisoners i found i found lots of examples of prisoners who've undergone transformation through turmoil actually in my book there are two chapters about incarceration or imprisonment because there were so many examples of um prisoners who, who underwent this transformation i actually i thought quite deeply about why there is such a common link between incarceration and transformation through turmoil and i thought it was, it was probably connected to partly connected to the feeling of having to let go when you when you go to prison you have to let go of everything which constituted your previous life everything which constitutes your identity is outside the prison walls you know your your role in society your relationships to other people your possessions um you know your status your achievements everything is out there on the other side so you have to let go of everything when you're in prison which can be a very unpleasant experience but for some people letting go can enable a deeper self to arise and also i found that in addicts i should say in addicts transformation through turmoil can manifest itself in a strange phenomenon which i called addiction release and i'll give you an example of that in a, in a short while but addiction release is when 
people have been addicts for long periods, usually for long periods, and they go through a long process of loss, a long process of slowly losing everything, which gives them a sense of identity. And usually they hit rock bottom, they reach the, the lowest point, often a point where they feel that they are close to death, where they become suicidal, they feel that they are physically close to death. And then suddenly and dramatically they undergo a transformation and part of that transformation involves no longer being oppressed by, by the craving for a substance or for, for alcohol or drugs. It involves a sudden release from that craving. And usually it doesn't return. Usually the, the release, the sense of release continues. I'll explain a little bit, a little bit more about that in a short while. But let me give, let me give you, um, you know, a couple of examples. People who go through transformation through turmoil, they feel that they are different people. There's a very clean and clear break in terms of their identity. So these, these are some quotes from, from my research. Uh, so one person said, it's like there are two people. There's a before and after. Another person said, there's no going back. I'm a different person now for the rest of my life. Another person said, I've moved up to another level of awareness, which I know is going to stay with me. It's like the transformation a caterpillar goes through during the chrysalis stage before emerging as a butterfly. That's quite a, you know, a beautiful poetic way of describing the transformation. It is as if a new self arises and takes over a person's identity and a higher self. You know, it's a self which functions on a much higher level and which is free from the suffering which seemed to oppress the old self. So here's a couple of examples from, from my research. These, these are a couple of stories which are featured in, in my book. The first um, is a woman who was diagnosed with cancer. This is a woman called Irene Murray. She was diagnosed with cancer and told that she only had probably six to nine months left to live. But her transformation occurred almost immediately as soon as she was diagnosed with cancer. And partly it was because it was the first time that she became intensely aware of death as a reality. So this is how she described it after she'd been diagnosed with cancer. She said, it was the first time I'd seen death as a reality and realized that life is just temporary. The following day I woke up and thought, I'm just so lucky to be alive, the fact that I'm still here. The air was so clean and fresh and everything I looked at seemed so vibrant and vivid. The trees were so green and everything was so alive. I became aware of this energy radi radiating from the trees. I had a tremendous feeling of connectedness. Like a lot of people, when they have this transformation, they, they expect it to fade away because it seems so remarkable and so different. But in, in, in almost every case that I've been aware of, it continues. It's, it, it becomes slightly less intense, but it becomes established at a less intense level as a person's new sense of identity. And that was Irene's experience. She said, that feeling was really intense for the first few, first few weeks, and it's remained ever since. It just blew me away. It really did. I used to just sit and think, this is amazing that things could just fall into place so quickly. As you probably guessed um, from my description, her cancer went into remission. But even though the cancer went into remission, she retained the heightened awareness which she gained from being diagnosed with cancer. And so everything about her life changed. She gave up her job. She had been a, an IT manager, but she gave up her job and retrained as a counselor. She became a therapist at a cancer hospital here in England. And she was so grateful that she'd undergone this, this awakening because it really was like an awakening as if scales had fallen from her eyes and she was seeing life as it really was and the world as it really was. Sadly, after 13 years, her cancer finally returned and she actually died a few years ago. But she, I was in contact with her not long before she died and she was really grateful that she'd spent she'd had these extra 13 years living in this heightened state of awareness and here's another example this is a a woman who was severely injured in a terrorist attack 
a woman called Jill Hicks from, she was originally from Australia, but she was living in London. Uh, this was in 2005, I think it was, when a series of bombs exploded in, in um, mainly in the tube stations in London. And Jill Hicks was sitting very close to one of the bombs when it exploded. She was very severely disabled. She, her legs were amputated below the knee. And she, she came very close to dying. She, she spent two or three weeks hovering on the brink of life and death. But when she recovered consciousness, and when she realized that she was going to survive, she felt that she was a different person, that she was going to live. She was living a different life. She actually called it life too, because it seemed so different to her previous life. And again, it was a very radical transformation in which everything seemed different. Her values changed, her perspective on life completely changed, and her behavior changed as well. And part of it was a lot of people who go, go through this transformation, they often remark on no longer taking things for granted. All of the simple, basic things in life become blessings. They become worthy of appreciation. So that was her experience. She said that, you know, from the moment I was given the option of choosing life, I vowed that I would never take anything for granted ever again. And life became very simple. People often remark, often remark about how simple life becomes after this transformation. All of the kind of triviality and complexity of life seems to dissolve away. So she said, I no longer look for complications and they don't come and find me. It's amazing. All the rubbish of life has just slid away. I feel liberated. And she also felt a, re felt a renewed sense of purpose. She said that my path is being laid and being lit every day. I can see so clearly where I'm meant to be going. It's like an airport runway where the bright lights along the strip guide the planes in. And her, her, her new purpose in life was to, to help, was to contribute. She founded a charity, a peace charity. She spent a lot of time speaking to different faith groups, different Islamic groups, different youth groups to try to, you know, create a sense of harmony and to you know, to promote the cause of peace. So finally, let me give you another example. This is um, directly related to uh, alcoholism, uh, to addiction. This is a woman called Eve, whose story I tell in my book. And she, she was uh, spent 25, 29 years as a heavy drinker uh, from a very young age. I think she started drinking at the age of 11. And slowly over those 29 years, Certainly over the final few years, everything began to break down. She began to lose everything. She couldn't hold down a job. Uh, her friends didn't trust her anymore. Her relationships broke down. Her family broke contact with her. Uh, she lost her money. And eventually she was homeless. She was living on the streets in Edinburgh. And she, was, she, she went shoplifting to, to, to fund her addiction. And at the end of this period, she felt, in her words, she was a wreck an empty shell. She was physically wrecked. She felt that she, she could only walk for a few steps and then she'd have to stop and sit down or lie down. And emotionally or spiritually, she was also wrecked. She'd, she'd, she'd tried to stop drinking many times, but never been able to. So she'd given up trying to stop. She felt that she had nothing to live for, nothing to give. And she thought, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't have the strength. So you know, feeling that she had nothing to live for, she attempted suicide. She tried to walk in front of a coach that was traveling at 40 miles an hour. But luckily the coach swerved and she survived. And the police came um, because it was an, an, an accident, an incident. And she thought she was going to be arrested by the police. But the policeman was actually a nice guy and said to her, you know, can I, can I, can I take you somewhere? Can I help you? Can I, can I take you to your parents or some family? So she told the police to take her to her parents' house. And she hadn't seen her parents for a long time. And when a mother saw her, her mother said, you're an alcoholic, I, I suppose I'll have to give you a drink. So her mother gave her a glass of wine. But she said it was, it was the strangest thing. This is how she described it. She said, I picked up the glass, lifted it, then put it down. I kept picking it up and putting it down. It wasn't me that was putting it down. And she... She was given some medication to, to deal with the withdrawal symptoms. When she came to, she looked at herself in the mirror. And this is how she described it. She said, I looked at myself 
And it was one of the strangest, the most surreal experiences I've ever had. I had no idea who I was. I felt like a completely different person. So it was as if she'd undergone a, a sudden shift in identity. It was, if, it was as if the person she used to be, the person who was an alcoholic, the person who carried the addiction, it was as if that person somehow died and a new self had emerged inside her. And the new self which emerged didn't carry the addiction because it was a completely new self. So she underwent that phenomenon of addiction release. She said that, that from that moment, she was free of craving for alcohol. And you can see this in the, the two pictures. The, the picture on the right is just after she'd undergone a transformation. You can see she's physically marked by, probably by the accident where she tried to throw herself in front of the coach. And on the left, you can see Eve as she is now, 11 years later. So at that moment, as I say, it was as if she became a different person. She said, my whole psyche changed completely. And after 29 years of alcoholism, she'd been through a lot of traumatic experiences, but she felt as though she was free of the trauma. She said, I have no trauma in spite of all the terrible things I went through. It was like being compact catapulted from one world into the next. She also felt a new sense of connection to other people, a sense of empathy towards other people, a desire to help other people. So she, she became very active in AA, so helping and supporting other people. And she felt a new sense of connection to nature. She said that, you know, one of the, one of the most remarkable things was how, how beautiful and real the world around her seemed to be. So that's um, an example of transformation through turmoil occurring in the context of addiction. So what, one of the things I wanted to understand was why this transformation occurs. You know, why do people who go through such intense turmoil undergo this transformation? And I explain it in terms of ego dissolution. That means that the, a person's normal identity collapses or dissolves away, either through intense stress or through a long period of loss and, and breakdown. If, if you are an addict for a long time, or if you go through a, a long period of depression, or if you go through bereavement or a diagnosis of cancer, what can happen is that your psychological attachments break down. All of the things which give you a sense of identity, you know, your, your sense of status, your sense of self-respect, your possessions, your success, everything which defines you is taken away. And when these things are taken away, your whole identity can collapse. You, know, you can undergo ego dissolution. And usually that's a painful experience. Usually it's equivalent to a breakdown. But in some people, there seems to be a latent higher self, a latent spiritually awakened self, which is just, which is just there. It's just ready and waiting to emerge. So when, when the normal ego breaks down, this spiritually awakened self naturally emerges like a like a phoenix from the ashes or like a like a butterfly from a chrysalis and it becomes a person's new identity that's why you know addictions can sometimes disappear that's why people can be free of trauma because the new self which is born doesn't carry the addiction or doesn't carry the trauma so that's what i think is happening in these experiences it's also related to certain other characteristics. It's, it's partly to do with how you respond to your predicament. If you are in a, a very tumultuous or desperate situation, you know, you, you, for, the first step is to acknowledge the situation, to acknowledge the reality of your predicament. Don't mentally push it away. Also, you need to acknowledge the negative feelings that the predicament creates. So, for example, if you, if you, face a bereavement many people when they face bereavement don't really acknowledge the reality of the situation same with a diagnosis of cancer you may not acknowledge the reality of your predicament but in order to go undergo growth or transformation you have to face squarely the reality of your situation and also the reality of the negative feelings which you experience the second stage is that you need to go into yourself to explore yourself. You know, again, many people 
have a fear of going inside themselves. They're afraid of what they might find inside themselves. But you have to be brave enough to take the step into yourself to explore your inner being and your subjective experiences. And when you do that, you often find a, an inner space which is free from the negativity, which observes the negativity, a kind of a peaceful witnessing self, a place of stillness, which is free from everything which is arising around it, whether it's negative thoughts and negative emotions. So that's the, that's, you know, that's the, the value of exploring yourself and centering yourself in a place of stillness and finding a place of stillness. You can find something within you which is not touched by the negativity around you. But perhaps the most important quality in this transformation, based on my research, is an attitude of acceptance. I found that a lot of people who undergo this transformation, they could pinpoint a moment of acceptance when they let go of resistance, when they open themselves to the reality of the situation and surrendered to their predicament. In many cases, transformation occurred, well, in some cases anyway, transformation occurred at the very moment when acceptance arose. So that, that's why I think acceptance, when, when, it, when we go through turmoil, when we face desperate predicaments, an attitude of acceptance is the key to allowing transformation to take place. So just um, for the last few minutes of my presentation or talk, I want to do a little bit, a short exercise on acceptance, just to illustrate the value and the power of acceptance. So let me close my slides for a moment. I've forgotten how to close my slides. Oh, here we go. Stop share. I often think of acceptance as a, an alchemy because it has such a, a powerful effect. It has this sort of amazing transformational potential. And I'd just like to, to begin this exercise by reading a, another poem of mine on, on acceptance. After the poem, I'll lead you straight into a, an exercise. This is a poem called The Alchemy of Acceptance. Emptiness can be a vacuum, cold and hostile, dark with danger. Or emptiness can be radiant space, glowing with soft stillness. And the only difference between them is acceptance. A task may seem tedious, a chore to rush through reluctantly or a task may seem rewarding, a process to relish with an attentive mind that reveals more richness the more present you become. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Pain may seem unbearable, searing through you from a sharp concentrated point so that you have no choice but to resist, to try to escape, to push away the pain. Or pain can be a sensation that you can move toward and merge with, that no longer has a center and dissipates through your being until it becomes soft and numb, no longer pain at all. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Trauma can break you down to nothing, destroy the identity you spent your whole life building up like an earthquake that leaves you in ruins. Or trauma can transform you, break open new depths and heights of your being, give rise to a greater structure, a miraculous new self. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Life can be frustrating and full of obstacles, with desires for a different life disturbing your mind. Or life can be fulfilling, full of opportunities, with a constant flow of gratitude for the gifts you have. 
And the only difference between them is acceptance. So I'd like you to, if you don't mind, close your eyes for a moment. And I'm going to guide you through a, a short exercise in acceptance. This exercise begins with a, a visualization. I'd like you to imagine that you're standing or sitting near the top of a mountain at the side of the highest part of a mountain or even at the peak of a mountain. And you're sitting there or standing there overlooking a landscape spread all around you. A panoramic landscape stretching in front of you. And the landscape represents your life. Everything which constitutes your life is there on this landscape in front of you. All of the, the tasks and responsibilities that fill your life. every aspect of your present life situation. Also, events from your past and also possible events from your future. Everything is spread out panoramically in front of you, your whole life, the landscape of your life, including all of the people in your life, all of the issues, that are in your life at the moment, all of the challenges, everything. And as you survey the landscape of your life, I'd like you to be aware of any areas of your life where you feel some resistance, any aspects of your life which cause you frustration or difficulty and which you find it hard to accept. Just locate any aspects of your life, such as those, and just hone in on them, just locate them and bring your attention to them. Maybe just begin with one, and we can move on to any others. And I'd like you to imagine that there is a cord which connects you to that aspect of your life, a real physical cord or bond which links you to that aspect of your life. And you can feel the resistance, you can feel the tension which that aspect of your life creates. You can feel the tension of the bond or the, the cord which connects you. Now what we're going to do is to release that connection. And we're also going to release the resistance that you feel to that aspect of your life. And we can do that in coordination with our breathing. So we're going to take a long, slow in-breath and a long, slow out-breath. And as you take the out-breath, I want you to imagine that the cord which connects you to that aspect of your life is dissolving. And as it dissolves, you release your resistance and feel a sense of openness and freedom. So let's try that. Let's take a long, slow in-breath. Then a long, slow out-breath, imagining that this cord is connecting, is, is dissolving. And you are releasing your resistance to this, past, this aspect of your life. As the core dissolves away, you feel a sense of openness, a sense of release. Let's do that again with one or two further breaths, just to check that the resistance has been released. Again, just breathe in and out slowly, releasing resistance, feeling a sense of openness, a sense of release.
And you can do that with any aspect of your life to which you feel resistance. Whether it's to certain tasks or responsibilities in your life. Whether it's to certain aspects of your life situation. Or certain aspects of life, certain fundamental aspects of life, such as the aging process or, or the, the inevitability of our death. Just release your resistance in yourself to that. And now I'd like you to just picture the whole of that landscape again, the whole of your life. Spread out, in, spread out in front of you without focusing on any individual aspects. And just for a moment, let's open ourselves completely to our lives as a whole, to the whole of that landscape. Just open yourself completely to the reality of your life as it is now. Accepting every aspect of your life Embracing the whole landscape of your life. As you do that, you'll probably feel a sense of oneness with your life. Because when we resist aspects of our lives, it creates a, a duality between us and reality. It creates discord and duality. So as you let go of resistance and open yourself to the whole landscape of your life, you'll feel discord fading away. You'll feel a sense of harmony and a sense of oneness with the whole of your life. So let's retain that mode of acceptance, that mode of openness. Let's allow the images to fade away from your mind. Return your attention to your inner space. Be aware of a feeling of harmony, and relaxation within your inner space. And now let's slowly open our eyes again and bring this exercise to a close. And that also brings my, my presentation to a close. Steve, that was just wonderful. Um, it was a fresh way to look at the process of recovery that I've been going through, and I can't thank you enough. It's You're welcome. Just wonderful. Thank you. It's really thank wonderful. I, I've used the deep breath a lot. And for me, I learned it with regard to pausing. That's a standard thing we talk about in recovery, and, and it has helped. You know what I've learned most of all is I had to unlearn an awful lot before I could accept the new things. Mm -hmm. But it worked. So we're so glad you came. Thank you so much. <laughs>